I agree. Those I think those are two great things to use, right? Pet friendly, all credit scores welcome. Yep. Yeah, the the credit score shouldn't define the quality of the tenant. I agree. There's some science, some art and science that has to go into that, mm. the evaluation overall. <laughs> Hart and Rob, how you guys doing, man? Good. Thanks. How are you? Wonderful. Rent Panda in the house again. It's the second time we're doing this. It is. Yeah? Cool. How was the drive in? Was, I actually took the train. You did? From, yeah. Where, where do you live? Hamilton. So okay. I went from one end to the other end. Okay. So you guys came in separate. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Well, I picked Rob up at the train because yeah. he thought a 45 minute walk from the train was <laughs> totally realistic this morning <laughs> in the pouring rain. But uh, mm -hmm. he let Got to get the steps in. Yeah. He lives yeah. life hard. Yeah? yeah, it's a hard life, man. Well, I was like, if if I could work for those two hours versus driving for potentially two hours, yeah. it makes sense to me. So. Yeah, I mean, look, that's that's the one good thing when you're on the train, right? Yeah, right. You get a little bit of work in, or or you can sleep. I used to do that a lot. Yeah, right. But yeah. Uh, Rent Panda back in the house. What's new? What's happening with you guys? We were talking about um, a property that you almost picked up there in uh, in Thunder Bay. <laughs> I got what two hundred and seven thou. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. It's going to turn into a, a six or seven bedroom student house, uh, eight minutes from the university and gross between 43 and 4,600 a month. Sorry, I missed this part. Though, but you got it though, right? No, we did not. Okay. Your contractor got it. Our contractor got it. Our mother. <laughs> so, yeah. We talked about it. We, you know, we decided not to get into a bidding war. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's an employee of ours. So, you know, we, there's enough room in Thunder Bay for everyone to play, yep. but it was a, a good deal. Um, but there's a, there's a lot up there on that one street that we were looking at. I think there's three or four properties, all within thirty or forty thousand dollars. So uh, there's more opportunity to come. What is the cash flow, approx? Like after you run your numbers conservatively, it'll probably net a thousand to fourteen hundred a month. That's so crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It still and, exists. And, and is there any issues up there though, getting those properties rented out, or is there like a bit of a uh, uh, a housing shortage for student rentals there's still demand specifically with student rentals there's always going to be demand there's lakehead there's conestoga um not Conestoga, confederation college yeah um there's a lot of international student demand up there yeah but when it comes to the the pace of demand as compared to southern ontario it's different but northern ontario is a beast on its own there's a lot of opportunity there there's cash flowing properties most people when you say thunder bay they think north bay uh, and so everyone's mind is focused as like North Bay is the top of the province. And there's yeah. another, you know, thousand kilometers on top of that. Yeah, and Thunder, Thunder Bay, Bay is, is far. Yeah. It's yeah. a really unique opportunity, though, for those who can understand the market or partner with those who do. Yeah. Um, so when we're looking at it as personal investments, there's a lot of opportunity. If you know the city can get trades, getting trades up there is difficult. So yeah. if you know people to get those trades in, yeah. there's a lot of money to be made. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, you know what? I think I got to move this camera up a little bit. I think it's a little low on you there. But sure. um, what is new with Rent Panic? Because we've, uh, again, we've done this before. I know you guys, I think last time we were talking, you guys were working on some reports and stuff. How's that coming along? Good, good. We have yeah. uh, we released last year's recap report. So summarizing the market for 2022, a little bit of projections for 2023. So rent increases quarter over quarter uh, for the full year. It's been good. I mean, eye-opening for sure, right? The yeah. the rent amounts, especially into this year, have essentially went back to prior to pandemic rates, right? You know, we dropped a little bit in Toronto, for example, like the apartment costs uh, for rent per month. And now it's a little bit uh, back to that, that rate overall. So, you know, a couple hundred dollars more than it used to be last year. For projections for rent, you know, we were uh, summarizing that every quarter would go up by at least six to 10%. And now we're seeing that it's probably closer to 10%, if not more, right? From some of those major markets. So not really? just Toronto. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's expected. So, right? so you're seeing the immigration making a big impact on what these rent prices totally. is. Is that essentially what you're saying? Yeah. As well as I think a lot of offices are going back now, right? They're mandating that the team needs to come back, whether it's, you know, a hybrid model or I'll call it like an advanced hybrid model where they're coming back three to four days a week, right? And you get the maybe special privilege of one day a week that you're working from home now. So it's it's a lot to commute, right? I mean, myself moving from Toronto to Hamilton, if I was to commute back to Toronto as a, you know, a regular job, that's a lot. It's, it takes a toll on you for three to four days a week, right? If you think about just average commute time of maybe an hour and 10 minutes each way, 
or you can just move back somewhere closer to the city. So I think like centralized in some of those big cities where you're, you're wanting to come back, it's more competition for houses again. Mm-hmm. And then you also have those people that are, have been waiting probably for a while to say like, I'll live in, you know, I'll use Hamilton as an example, but I'll live in Hamilton for now, right? I'll pay less on rent, for example, save up money, and then I'll come back to the city. Or just, I waited it out and, you know, buying power is less than it was. And now I still have to rent somewhere. I don't want to commute an hour and 10 minutes each way. Right. I'd rather move somewhere closer to the city. So, yeah, I, I you know, I feel for, for everyone, but it's, it's, it is what it is, right? That is hey, listen, right you know now. what? I, I remember when we bought our first home. And it was a condo. It was in Toronto. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a condo. We picked it up for 120, 120,000. Nice. Okay. <laughs> By it was McCowan and Steels, McCowan Steels area. Okay. okay. Then when our family started to grow, yeah. we wanted to stay in Toronto. Guess what? Couldn't afford it. Yeah. So we had to move out. Yeah. That was a normal thing. Mm-hmm. Like it's not like it's an abnormal thing, yeah. right? And then obviously, when as your city starts to grow, people start to come in. Sometimes you got to move out a little bit. Yep. And if you can move back into the city later on, fine. But you know, you got to do these things. Unfortunately, yep. now it's kind of going back to the report. I, like I looked at this report. This yep. report is like detailed. Thank you. <laughs> Where can people find this report? Is it on the website, or do they get to sign up for your newsletter to get it? Because it's really an interesting report. Yeah, it's on the website. I mean, Rob spends hundreds of hours on this report. Uh, to say the on, least. To say the least. Yeah. And we've got partners at Door Insight that are also pulling data. Um, it's available on the website. And yeah. I think the key to it is really to look at the the numbers that matter for you as an investor or even you as a renter. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of people will generalize Ontario rents or rents across Canada are going up. Yep. And what we've done differently with our report is looked at the cities where people are actually investing. You know, we've always had a focus on tier two cities, as we call them, essentially anything outside of Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver. Yep. And those tier two cities, those are the investable cities. Those are where people are really living. Yes, the GTA is important. Um, but if you've got investments in Kingston, you want to know what's happening in Kingston. So the detail that we've put into it is to really advise investors and their future tenants on what's actually happening in those smaller cities. Yeah, for sure. That's and- true. Yeah, and to add to that, just in terms of the report itself, we didn't like how other rent reports, we won't name them, but (laughs) come out with average amount of rent, right? And if you had a couple, for example, tier two cities, right? If you have less um, numbers of, of rentals to look at, if there was just that really beautiful premium property that's going to escalate the rent and, and change the average overall to something that's really not relative to that market. Mm-hmm. So we changed it to median rent overall. So we're taking five of the top 10 listing sites in Canada and essentially saying that, okay, this is the median rent overall that you can expect as an investor versus the average is definitely going to be skewed higher than what you traditionally see. Because I think that's the one thing that we're noticing when we're talking to the investors that we work with is that they expected a higher rent amount, especially if you're not too familiar with that city, right? You might've found a good deal, which is great. And that's that's amazing. But when you run the numbers, really look like I would say our rent report to say this is probably a, a more normal look at the market and what you can expect. If you get more, that's great. And we'd love to help you do that. Um, but, you know, it's it's really an understanding of of that market, especially as Hart said, tier two markets and uh, and beyond the Toronto's of, of the world. Right. Right. So looking at this report, it'll give you a good idea, a good understanding in regards to where the hot markets are. Yep. Where are the hot markets? <laughs> It depends on what your criteria is for hot. Um, True. A lot of people right now are focused on cash flow, obviously. Um, As rates are increasing, cash flow is becoming less and less uh, attainable. Um, But there are really hot markets when it comes to finding cash flowing properties. Obviously, appreciation skepticism is not the safest thing to do right now as a market. Um, But when you look at tenant demand, really, it's hot everywhere with the the right asset in mind. You know, if you think about student rentals, Guelph was probably the hottest market because they over enrolled the population. If you look at, you know, Hamilton as an example, it's really hot for people who are in that young professional category who are looking to start a family. So when we talk to investors about what they're looking for for their portfolio, you need to identify you as yourself, an investor, what type of investor you are, what you want your portfolio to look like, and then find the hot markets for you 
and for those assets that you want a part of your portfolio. Right. So, I mean, myself personally, I was looking at student rentals in Thunder Bay, mm -hmm. and those are cash flowing opportunities, but I know that the appreciation is going to be almost nothing, right? We're going to hold on to that for 10, 20 years. We're going to pay off those mortgages. It's going to cash flow a little bit or a lot every single month. Yeah. Um, but it's not the same investment strategy as looking at, you know, Barry rentals with, you know, young families moving up there or Hamilton rentals. Mm -hmm. So it's always about defining yourself as an investor first and then identifying what is hot for you. Right. What, what area are you guys focused in on now? Like, well, not even say focus, but where have you expanded to? As, Just a, as a last, business or I, personally? In, no, in as, as a business. So somebody's listening, they're like, okay, you know what? I, I want to learn a little bit more about Rent Panda. Mm -hmm. uh, I may want to use your services because, you know, look, I, I think we all know this is probably the most difficult piece of the real estate investment business yeah. is finding the right tenants. This is one of the reasons why it took me a while to get into the real estate market because I'm like, oh my God, like tenants, are they going to destroy my home? Yeah. Right. Maybe I can't get them out. All these things kind of go through your head. So how does Rent Panda help a, a new investor or even an experienced investor? And, and what markets are you in right now that you can provide that that level of service for them? Yeah. In terms of business growth, we've been able to expand across all of Ontario. Um, all you know, of Ontario. Yep. Yeah, so other than, you know, or sorry, two years ago, I mean, we just expanded to Guelph from Thunder Bay. Yeah. And we've set up uh, boots on the ground. So it's not like we have, you know, a, a remote connection to the clients that we work with or, you know, the investors that we work with. So we have someone who knows that market. Um, in cases like, for example, parts of Toronto and Hamilton, Hart and myself would, would cover those. So we're we're there invested in in the client's business as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're, we're across Ontario. So we'd love to be across Canada, obviously, someday. Um, but right now, the expansion across Ontario, we're able to help in all the major markets, tier two markets and, and beyond. So um, in terms of helping um, find a tenant, if that's what you're well, we that's gonna probably that could be like a three hour conversation on, right. on finding a tenant. I think when we do our walkthroughs, we yeah. try to find out the goal of the landlord, right? Because even just simply as like communication strategy for a landlord, like it's different when you are communicating with the students, for example, versus a family, versus a first time renter, versus someone who's been renting for a long time. So try to find the ideal renter profile that fits your property. You know, maybe you had great experience before as a landlord and you had a family in there, right? And the property was treated well. Uh, you know, that may be a great fit moving forward, right? That's not to say you wouldn't look at any tenants that might make sense, but at least start there. And then once we have like a good understanding of who that profile is, then we start to look at, okay, let's let's list on, a you know, many sites, Rent Panda included. We have our own not the Tetron home, but we have, you know, a free listing site for landlords. It's free for them. It's free for the tenants to look. Um, you know, we we use that site for pretty good traffic, especially since we've expanded across Ontario. We've also promoted it as well. Yep. Um, we also would list on some of maybe the local sites that that make sense. So we're trying to figure out, you know, a large number of people, but we don't want to take a whole number of people through a property, right? If right. you're if you think about you know, having an open house, it might be a luxury in, for example, Toronto sometimes, right? Where you have a Saturday open house come when you need. For us, it's all about finding quality first over quantity and the right fit of the tenant versus bringing a whole bunch of people to property. I mean, that's not efficient for anybody and it's a lot to manage along the way. So instead of asking, you know, five, 10 people, or sorry, 100 people to come to a day of showings, it's better to ask the five, 10 people that already fit the criteria that we've outlined at the start of the conversation, the relationship with the landlord to say, hey, you know, this, these, these could be a good fit um, or this profile could be a good fit and we'll do a walkthrough. Uh, we, we start from scratch essentially, right? We don't hold tenant lists. We don't have this bucket of tenants. The turnover, let's say it's every two to three months, right? On a tenant essentially going through their life cycle of a rental and we essentially start from scratch. So. If we're trying to find that tenant, we have a large tenant pool and then we filter down from there. Okay. We, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, so, so what I was gonna say now, are you seeing a trend uh, for more student rentals for these investors? Are you seeing more short-term rentals? Do you even help with that? Or short-term, mid-term rentals? Do you guys get into that? Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna start me down a rant. Yeah. <laughs> uh oh, so, it, it isn't brother. Go ahead and yeah. rant right there, real talk. So I, so I, you I gotta will say, say um, <laughs> not, not to, uh, to say anything bad about the real estate investment space. Um, but there's definitely a fad of real estate investing that has happened over the last few years. Yeah. Money was cheap. 
people heard a lot of positive stories, a lot of short-term rental success where people made a lot of money um, and a lot of long-term rental success because money was cheap. People were buying properties. And we find that a lot of landlords coming to us these days have no education on renting. Um, so they have a ton of education or a ton of support when it comes to investing. And investing is sexy, right? You go out, you buy properties, you look at them, you run numbers. It looks good. Everyone's wearing suits and ties. And then all of a sudden, you've got to place that tenant. You have to manage that tenant. You have to figure out the day-to-day -day of running that property as a business. And a large majority of new investors don't understand that renting is a massive component when it comes to you know, the overall journey Listen, as a real estate it, it investor. It can make or break you. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And you know this as an experienced investor, but your tenants are your stakeholders, right? You're running a business and that business involves an asset and those stakeholders. And so if you treat the tenants like a commodity, if they're just hundreds and hundreds of them ready knocking down your door, you will place a bad tenant and you will pay for it in the long run. Mm -hmm. So the fad of real estate investing you know, it's great for us as a business because there's more people coming our way. It's great for real estate agents. It's great overall, as long as we are positioned to present landlords with rental education. And so Rent Panda wants to come in as the rental expert. You know, we're not just placing tenants. We're not just a leasing service. We treat every client with an educational mindset. And so even though we're doing the work, we're walking them through every step of the process. We're educating them along the way. It's why we're partnered with people like you where, you know, an entity can focus on real estate investing and we can come in and tack on the kind of dirty part of it, right? The, right. The figuring out how to rent the place. And we can be the experts in that. And we feel like just like, you know, garbage collection is a lucrative business for those who want to go into it. The, the typically and stigmatized grimy part of real estate investing is renting. Mm -hmm. And so we want to come in there and clean that up and be the partner who can help real estate investors rent properly right now are you doing the midterm i don't i don't think i heard that or in so, the short term so i, know, I think that was where you're going with your rant a little bit so <laughs> yes. okay we're not doing short-term rentals you know okay. short-term rentals obviously are dominated by airbnb, airbnb vrbo those sites yep. um we're very aware of short-term rental strategies and we're also very aware of midterm rental strategies um i have a little bit of bone to pick with midterm rental um the midterm renting strategy in general because a lot of landlords Again, they, they see a headline and they think midterm rentals, I'm now just going to jump into this. And they don't educate themselves enough on understanding that a midterm rental is actually a long-term rental with the right screening process. Mm -hmm. And you know, you've talked about this, Sarah Larby's talked about this. It's really about finding the right person and screening them so you know that they are going to leave your place after that allotted duration. Yep. You know, you can have an Airbnb contract in place where they're going to stay for you know, over 28 days, but hopefully just a couple of months, you're going to charge those higher rates. Um, but as Sarah says many times, you got to have a good paralegal at your side, because if you encounter someone who doesn't leave, you want to be able to pursue that and get them out. Yeah. And not only just that, I mean, look, it, even to get it set up is not cheap. Right. Yep. You know, you, you could be into 10, 20, 30,000, depending yep. on, you know, the, the furniture you're putting in there. Yep. Human beings are very needy people. You need, yes. they need toilet paper and yep. paper towel and forks and spoons. And there's a lot of <laughs> shit that goes along with yep. it, right? Yep. And yep. all of a sudden now you, you furnish this property and then you don't get the rents maybe that you're thinking, or maybe yep. you're not in the right neighborhood. And so these are things you got to be aware of. Yeah. And I think a lot of people look at midterm rentals as a solution to a problem that they have with their short-term rental property. So, you know, Midland generally and tiny Ontario is a good example where a lot of investment went in there for short-term rentals, you know, with Sega Beach and that kind of area. And then new legislation was passed and Airbnbs became difficult to push through and difficult to manage. And people naturally went, okay, well, I have to dump this property on the long-term market now. And then all of a sudden midterm rentals came forward as a possible strategy. And without truly educating themselves on that strategy, they just kind of have this idea of midterm rentals here to save them because they've run their numbers on short-term rental revenues. And when they look at what they can bring in from a long-term rental perspective, it just doesn't make sense. And so the option is mid sell the property yeah. or try this midterm thing. But again, this fad of real estate investing is there and that people don't understand that they have to invest in themselves from an educational perspective. You know what I think happened is over the last couple of years is it, because money was so cheap, yep. people thought real estate investing was so easy. Exactly. And they can make money and retire and become incredibly wealthy in like two or three years. Yeah. That's not the thing, man. No. It doesn't work like that. I've been doing this since 2008. 
and it takes time. Yep, yep. You know, this is not like a short term play, you know, to build wealth. You know, it's not a get rich quick. It's just a get rich for sure. Yep. So, you know, you got to hold these properties. Right. For sure. and, and, and I think people got caught last year in thinking something else. Yeah. Right? And I think a lot of people jump in thinking that the success stories are every story mm -hmm. and also hoping for it to happen quick. Right. There's a lot of part time investors who still have their full time jobs. And they're very aspirational to drop that full-time job in a year or two. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I worked at Red Panda five years part-time <laughs> and I was working two jobs and that's what it takes to run a business. And you've done the same and you, I had conversations. You too, huh? I thought it was yeah, only me. No. <laughs> and I mean, Darlene and I have talked about this quite a bit too, where you have to grind over the first two, three, four, five, ten 10 years maybe. And a lot of people just think, you know, two years into real estate investing, I pick up a couple properties and now I'm out of my full-time job, you know, on Bay Street or whatever it ends up. Well, being. you do a perfect burr twice. You say, oh my God, this thing is easy. Right. I just pulled all my money out, you know, right. You know, in infinite ROI. Yeah. And then you place the wrong tenant and you lose $60,000 in arrears. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's, as I was going to mention, is that the risk factor, right? Like there's, there's two big ones, which is for sure risky and non-payment of rent. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is if you're relying on that rent amount to come in to pay the mortgage or the majority of the mortgage, yeah, that's where we see situations come up where it's an issue, right? And and if you're relying on you know, two examples being midterm to cover that whole um, side of the mortgage is that A, it probably won't just based on the numbers and something that we kind of have to give the reality of the situation to landlords. And then B is, yeah, if you don't have a tenant paying rent for whatever reason, it's it's non-payment of rent regardless of whatever it is, how are you going to deal with that, right? Yeah. What's your plan B or your option that you have to to deal with it? And that's unfortunately, yeah, you, at that point, you're either selling or mm -hmm. another option. Yeah. Have you seen a lot of people move over to you to acquire your services that were using or trying the short-term rental model or the midterm rental model? And they're like, okay, this, these two are not working. I, I need to go back to long-term. It, it's I have think you, just have, like simply it's difficult to find a tenant sometimes, especially if you're trying to find someone that that's looking for a midterm rental. Right. And, and depends on the city that you're. But you're I'm saying at. like, are they changing their strategies? Have you seen people yeah, do that? Like, they're like, look, guys, I tried these two strategies. I need yes. to go to long term. Yes. So you're seeing a trend happening yeah. in that. Okay. Yeah. So we've had short term and midterm say, OK, listen, we need another strategy. We've already looked at our numbers for a full year, for example, mm -hmm. and we need your services to find a tenant. Or it's, you know, we've done the midterm. And as Hart said, there's rules involved in doing the midterm and a bad situation had happened. And now I have to change over to the year because I had a bad experience along the way, which we're happy to educate, as Hart said, and and rectify the situation. It's just, you know, sometimes you have to go through that, I call it like a hiccup along the way and, and find that right tenant. So. Right. Yeah. What type of properties are you guys filling? Single family, two units? Like how high do you guys go? Everything and anything. Yeah. <laughs> so we've done as small as subletting rooms and as high as filling full pre-construction buildings. Um, we've done 18 unit buildings for investors in kind of the small multifamily space, um, single family homes, duplexes, triplexes, everything in between. Mm. Um, there's a lot of pre-construction condos hitting the market right mm. now that we're working on. It's a little bit of a different beast because the challenge that landlords and investors are afraid of is that building opens up and all of a sudden it goes from zero properties available in that neighborhood to 47 identical one bedroom condos that are all right. priced at the very, very top of the market. Hmm. Um, so we've done probably a dozen of these over the last few weeks and we're just seeing the expectations kind of broken by a lot of people because right. they're listing it. You know, sometimes there's leasing um, leasing company partnerships between the developers and a leasing operation yeah, or a realtor. Yeah. Um, and they're just dumping, you know, 25, 30, 35 properties on MLS and it's two bedrooms in Toronto for 2850 and they're yeah. all exactly the same. Yeah. And they need 2850 or probably even more yeah. just yeah. to even make this thing, you know, break even. Yeah. Right. Especially and with the interest rates of where they are. Most are not breaking even. Oh, and I, so I, I guarantee they're not. We come in there and say, in reality, when is this going to get rented? Are you, you're going to sit on vacancy for two, three, four months until all of those units are filled. And people talk about the crazy low vacancy rates in Toronto as an example. But the reality is, if you look at those buildings, there are properties sitting for two, three, four months waiting for the right tenant because those those investors have also bought that property with high expectations mm -hmm. and expectations of a certain type of tenant. You know, they want that 
dual income young couple who's just moving, you know, just north of Toronto, who's mm -hmm. looking to stay in the property for two years because they want to increase the rent when they move out, even though it's not rent controlled, which a lot of people don't educate themselves on. Um, and so the they're the not rent controlled. No, because they're new buildings. It's, yeah, yeah. So you're right. Yeah. So there's no rent yeah. control. So, you know, at you the end of the it. year, and let's talk about that just real quickly. Sure. So essentially, there's no rent control on these homes that were built after, is it 20? So anything that is first occupied before November 2018 yeah. um, is rent controlled, which means you can only increase the rent yeah. every 12 months based on the allowable government limit for that year. Correct. And this year was 2.5. Correct. Yeah. Uh, last year was zero. The year before that was 1.2%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of these pre-construction condos are being built with no rent control in mind. So the prices are higher. The starting prices are quite high. Um, and a lot of landlords are starting their prices incredibly high because they don't know about rent control and they assume they are under rent control. But because that unit hasn't been occupied prior to November of 2018, because it's just been built, they're not within rent control. So every 12 months with 90 days notice, they can increase the rent however much they want. Now that's going to create a system where they're going to be able to raise the rent based on the market allowance, right? So if they try and raise the rent a thousand bucks, the tenant's going to leave because they can get another place, one of the other 37 right. in right. the building. But you might be able to raise it a couple hundred dollars yeah. and maybe now that tenant's in there, they like the location, they yeah. may not want to move. So now you can kind of maybe get a little bit more, yeah. I guess, cash flow back into your pockets potentially. Yeah, you also, yeah, yeah. You also have to do the valuation of what's it going to be in terms of cash flow without having a tenant, right? If you think about vacancy, just one month is significantly worse than just raising the, the rent by... $100, $200, whatever it may be. Now you have to run the, the numbers and whatever makes sense. But most of the time it's like tenants are reasonable, right? They don't want to move. That moving cost is high. Two, if you have damage in your property or something that you have to take care of, paint, whatever it may be prior to having a tenant in, that's more vacancy you know, time across the board. So that's what I think like, sure, you can charge $1,000 if you really wanted to. But as Hart said, there's other options available. And financially for a tenant side, they probably want to lean towards another property versus yours if it's going to be a thousand dollars more a month. So, so, so do you provide ground. that you're providing negotiation strategies with the investor and the potential tenant, right? As opposed to just saying, "Forget it, see you later." Forget it, see you later, because you know you you sit on a property for like two or three months vacancy. That starts to hurt. I've yep. been yes. there. Oh yeah, you know the difference between us and anyone else who's going to rent out your property is we're leasing day in day out yeah. we see it every day we've got our rent report so we're tracking what's happening in these rental markets mm -hmm. and our landlords aren't just transactions right their clients just like a real estate agent or a mortgage broker is going to always be there for advice and support and so we actually in your parking lot we're on a call with a landlord where we placed the tenants a year and a half ago and now she's gotten pseudo notice that they want to move out and she doesn't know what is the right time frame to arrange for that N11 because she wants student rentals in Guelph. And so she gives us a call and we sit in the parking lot for 10 minutes and talk about strategies to maximize her return with that property and her specific strategy. This was a client that we've been dealing with for about four or five years now. Mm -hmm. So with Rent Panda, yes, leasing is transactional but we're always there as the stewards of that rental relationship. And we can help people. We can help them navigate, you know, placing a new tenant. We can help them navigate the right way to approach a current tenant who you want to stay. Um, there's been sticky situations that have come up so we can have conversations about how to allow a tenant to break a lease early with, you know, penalties that may be amicable to both parties. Um, that's another one that we're doing in, right now. Um, so there's always benefit to having the rental experts at your side in the same way that you would hire a real estate investment coach. And they're there throughout your entire journey. You can always give them a call. Right. Um, we're there. You're a client for life, essentially, if you use us once. Do you get involved with cash for keys? We have conversations with, like right now as a, as a business model, we don't get involved okay. right now. Maybe in the future, that would be Mm -hmm. That'd be something we get into, but we do advise landlords, right? So I think like to add to Hart's point, it's more about how can we help versus let's let us help you find a tenant, right? Mm -hmm. um, we pride ourselves on having that expertise and having those conversations. If a landlord comes to us and says, hey, you know, I, I'm looking to do this, we for sure will have a conversation and make sure that we, we help them out. Like both Hart and I started 13, 14 years ago. I don't know, let's say. 
in client service, right? So we've always talked about having a relationship with a landlord. We don't want a transactional one-off relationship where, you know, we find you a tenant and goodbye. We're always there. We always have our phones on. We're working yeah. to to help, you know, place the tenants as well as advise during that rental journey. So yeah. I'm sure you must come across it a lot where, you know, an investor gives you guys a call, yep. you know, they've listened to a podcast and like, oh, Cash for keys. This is easy. I'm just going to buy this property. And I've got like these tenants that have been there for like 30 years and they're paying $400 a month. <laughs> yep. And all of a sudden now they're like, hold on a second. This is not as easy as I thought. Yep. Because now where are you putting these tenants that they're going to be able to go find some other property that they can even afford? Because yep. a lot of the times they're they're on a certain budget. Mm -hmm. They're yep. only getting X amount of money coming in. So I don't think it's as simple as some, some people think it is. No. And yeah. I mean, we do have a paralegal on staff. Yeah. So if we need to formally help with the cash for keys arrangement, we yep. can do that. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the reality is, is oftentimes we're not brought in soon enough. And so part of what we're trying to do as a business is build more relationships with people like yourself, where we can be a part of the conversation prior to the property purchase. And a good example of this is in rent assessment. So again, we're the rental experts. We produce the rent report. And yet a lot of people are buying properties with the advice of what they can get in rent from a realtor who may not know the area, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people are GTA investors with a GTA realtor looking at properties in St. Catharines. And, you know, the realtor is looking at MLS. They're looking at comparable data, which is fair, and providing a rent assessment on that front. And that rent assessment is typically high because the MLS listings, like if you have a Toronto bias, MLS listings are going to be higher than the rest of the market. And we would love to partner with every realtor who's buying investment properties for their clients to come in and say, just let us do a free rent assessment. It takes us 10 minutes to pull that together because we have the proprietary data. And if we can give you a realistic rent assessment, that goes into your number crunching. And so you may not have expectations that are wildly over what market rent is and your numbers will actually make sense right and maybe you won't buy that property because the rent is two or three hundred dollars less per unit and it's a triplex you're looking at um, and so the the refined numbers of a rent assessment are just as important as how to arrange for a cash for keys agreement and factor in that line item as part of your budget so we want to get involved as early as possible and provide that rental expertise and for us us joining in and earlier in their journey mm -hmm. just means that those real estate investors are going to be better set up for success, which means they're going to buy more properties and then give us the leasing work. So for us, it's it's a win-win. When you make a smart investment, we're going to win in the long term. Right. Yeah. Now, after you've put the tenant into the property, what about maintenance? Do you guys get involved with that or is it just more recommendation because you've partnered with you know, a handyman or you know, a GC in that particular area? Good question. Um, that's one of the key updates that has happened over the last month or two, where we used to just parse out the there's recommendation. There's always updates you guys have. <laughs> we, we, we need to go through all these updates. <laughs> Man, yeah. there's always something. You guys are always doing something. To so anyways, go yeah. on. Yes, that's good. So, you know, when we look at the spectrum of services for real estate investors, for landlords, mm -hmm. we built out our tech product, right? We started as a tech company through and through. And we built a marketplace with tools for landlords to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. Then landlords came to us and said, great tools, but I don't want to do it myself because I'm scared of finding the wrong tenant. Yep. We built out the leasing services. Um, at the same time, in Thunder Bay, where we started, we built out a property management operation because landlords said, great, you found me the tenant. Now can you manage them for me? You know, Maybe I'm a passive investor. Maybe I'm an out-of-town investor. I need someone reliable who knows the market. That was a Thunder Bay test. Um, we've got about 190 units under management up there, and now, just in Thunder Bay. Just in Thunder Bay, yeah. Um, how many guys? How many properties are you guys managing right now? Uh, just well, 191. Um, I will say. So we just started the launch of property management across the rest of the province. It's in its infancy, so we're just doing minor tests in certain regions. Um, but we have a slightly different model for property management. So we kind of dubbed ourselves as like the no frills of property management where okay. most property managers, you know, you've got your percentage of monthly rent. They're on the ground in a region. They can visit the property and they're going to charge you for it, right? They've got a team and most are localized. So if you're a GTA investor with your properties in Kingston, you're going to find a Kingston property manager to manage that unit. And they may charge you five, six, nine, 10% of monthly rent, generally in that range, five to 10%. Um, and they're going to handle it all for you there. When things go wrong, they're going to tack on management fees on top of that. 
our model is when things are going right, you should pay less because we have to work less. So it's a flat rate per unit. And usually it's not a percentage of rent. It's a flat fee between about $59 and $99 a month. And that covers all of the basics. So rent collection, triaging, repair and maintenance out to trades within the region, dealing with tenant communication. So that two in the morning phone call about the leaky faucet we're going to deal with 24-7, 365 all of your basic inspections. Um, but from there, that's the base package. So new condo, you want someone to manage it. It's unlikely things are going to go bad. You're going to get charged less. And then when things go wrong, you know we have to call out that plumber. We tack on a small management fee onto that plumber, onto that electrician. So right. as things, as we have to do more work, we charge management fees. I like fees that on top model. That. That's a good model. Yeah. And it's essentially. I don't know if I'm trying to think if I've heard of anybody else that does it like that, where they charge cheaper, but they charge a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, that to me, Most property managers will bake that in. So they're actually charging you more right. on top of their management fee. Yeah. And our whole model is if you take care of your property, if you're handing us over a good property that doesn't need massive rehab or tenants to be kicked out and new tenants to be placed in, it's a simple. You know, solution and and we want to be there for the passive investors who are actively growing good portfolios and so why would we charge more when we're not actually doing any of that work mm -hmm. um, and the way that we've enabled that is through centralized operations so we very transparently say if your tenant calls and your tenant is in kingston we don't need someone in kingston to answer the phone we just need someone to answer the phone right. and then when a plumber needs to be called they need their list of verified vendors to do plumbing work in kingston Right. And so a lot of. So you have essentially like a call center. Exactly. Yeah. 24 7, 365. Again, this is all in the testing phase. Um, but, you know, we've taken on properties in Fergus now. We're looking to take on properties in Cornwall. And we're trying to test this model um, and see whether or not investors and landlords want it. Right. So yeah. something that we've learned. Are you testing it through like a virtual assistant? Or, or do you actually, did you hire yeah. somebody to do this? Yeah, so we've got the team set up to do it, to manage 24-7, 365. That's awesome. And we've learned all of our mistakes in Thunder Bay as that test bed. So we've been managing properties for up almost four years now in Thunder Bay with those 190 units. And all of those learnings get parsed into how to build an efficient system that could be handled remotely with low monthly fees. Good yeah. idea. Our yeah. big thing is all about process. We're constantly revising, revising process. Yeah. So Both Hart and I live on a project management mindset where you know things can be easier, more efficient. And we did that when we built the whole screening tool, which I'm sure we can talk about later. But um, you know, we we use that same type of thinking for the actual project uh, property management side, where it's a well-oiled machine will refine where we need to, but it should be efficient across the board for yeah. any investor that works with us and our own team as well. Yeah, like as you grow, like you need the systems and processes yeah. in place. You know, that's one of the the most important things that I learned working at TD Bank yeah. and seeing it at, at a high level and seeing a large company with the process and the systems and just everything and then the meetings and who's doing this. And, and you've got to be able to like to be able to see it at that high level. And I think you guys got that from where you guys used to work yep. to then say, hey, these are things that we need to get ahead of because we can see where we're potentially growing. And if we don't have these systems and processes in place, it's just going to get out of hand real, real quick. Yep. It's a lot easier to solve the problem. Well, our brains are about, hey, there's five solutions and we'll figure that out from there. Um, but secondly, it's just when you have the investor mindset as well, and you're saying like, listen, if I was going to create something that would suit my needs, it's a lot easier to create a solution for investors as well, right? Yeah. And across the board, and whether we, you know, if we expand the business in certain areas, it's always based on some type of solution that we've learned through the business in the last couple of years, right? I mean, we're six plus years old now, right? So yeah. it's a lot of um, learning and education for ourselves and define, refining the process along the way. So right, um, yeah, it works for us and, yeah. and it definitely works for the clients that we Now, while this is at the top of my head, you want to get back to screening. You said- you, Yeah, you have I, well, because originally you had asked me about like how we look at tenants. Yeah. Um, we had, I'll just say like, several upon several chats with landlords over the last let's say consistently last six years for sure but the last two years um we talked to all of our clients in depth whether it's you know we're working on on a property that they have or just in general just to know more about you know what's bothering them and in a lot of those conversations screening always came up we did screening on our own but we never had a system to do that um so we decided let's build one that our team can use landlords can use it if they want to but 
you know, for the most part, we're we're employed or, or working with a, a client where we're we're doing the screening. But we start which, from is, which is the white glove treatment? Yeah, white glove treatment. You have yep. both, right? I, yep. I could do it myself, do it yourself, or white glove. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So majority of of clients that we work with or investors that we work with are, are white glove, right? I'll give you the keys. You take it from there, which we're happy to do that. Mm -hmm. Your first time investor or your seasoned investor. It's all the same, and we're happy to kind of cater the conversation however it needs to be. Yep. Um, but we built this system to essentially help define what a quality tenant is for landlords. And what we're always trying to do is mitigate risk, right? Uh, being in a, 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 an investor and you're, you're getting a property, as we talked about, and it, maybe it's a large portion of your mortgage that you're paying off, our whole job is to mitigate or lower risk as you know more about that tenant. So we don't just do the typical, and I'm not saying everybody does this, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, but we have heard it's like, hey, I just have their ID and I have their pay stub. Well, I'm not saying that everyone photoshops, you know, it's it, I'm more about data, right? So data doesn't lie. We do not just the typical credit check, background check. We do income and uh, employment uh, verification, expense verification. We do facial recognition technology on the actual ID. So it's not just an ID that's sent through email, for example. Um, we do the basic information that you need to know, which I think is table stakes um, you know, for a profile. But we put that all together to create this tenant profile that hopefully matches that initial conversation. But it's a very detailed look at that tenant. So a landlord can say, OK, I'm, I'm, whatever tenant I pick is always going to be a risk. But based on what I know, you know, financial health, their family situation, a little bit of background against them, it's I, I understand this tenant basically like it's my neighbor, for example, and I'm comfortable in renting to this tenant. So we always do that that initial gut check or that final gut check with a, a landlord, and landlords usually like, yeah, because I you, you have so much information about them that you pull, right? Yeah. Um, and, and you know what? And that's so important, especially in today's day and age. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, we, we've all heard the recent news with title insurance and people, these fraudsters selling people's homes yeah. underneath their, uh, right underneath their noses, you know, and, and even with filling your property now and, and as these tenants and technology gets more sophisticated, yeah. you also as a landlord need to be able to access and use these tools so that you're staying one step ahead yeah. of these fraudsters as well too yeah. in this game yeah right and it, think, sound, and it sounds like you guys are doing it well well that's a perfect point i mean there's been stories of rental document fraud as well yeah. and we always say to landlords it's pure laziness not to pull your own credit check these days mm -hmm. there are so many options out there we have our own single key has theirs front lobby has theirs the access to a directly pulled Equifax credit report is so easy to come by that it, it's just pure laziness if landlords aren't pulling their own. That's a good point. So yeah. you're saying that landlords should, or or you should at least pull your the, the credit on that potential tenant as opposed to the tenant giving it to you. Yeah, one thousand percent. Yeah, you Not don't 100, know. 1, you, you don't yeah. know where it came from, frankly, right? Yeah, uh, and and we obviously want to lean on the side of believability on whatever gets sent through. But as I said, when it gets to pure data that you're pulling and that you know the source where it came from, is that you can understand that that dynamic or, or numbers, for example, in the credit check mm -hmm. um, that you've pulled. But And we don't just pull that, right? That's that's like the very basic information that you should pull as a, as a landlord, right? There's background checks. We do income and expense verification. So if you have an employment letter, that's great. But again, that's a document that's been provided by an external source through, you know, the tenant. It could be through the workplace, but that doesn't exactly say that that tenant either makes X amount per hour, you know, guaranteed amount of hours or a salary, for example. And pulling that through our system, for example, like we do that for the white glove service for landlords. We not only say, hey, your employment letter lines up or the tenant employment letter lines up but I've checked their accounts, right? Through open banking, here's exactly what they pull in, bi-weekly or whatever it may be in terms of the cadence. And also, you know, in terms of financial health overall, this tenant is, is a quality tenant, right? It's not like there are heavy debts that they're servicing. So for example, I could tell you if, you know, speaking on Hart's point, if, if I'm a tenant and I make, for example, six figures and that looks great for a landlord, you may verify that they, they make six figures, but what if they're servicing a heavy debt along the way, right? 
And then rent becomes a huge risk factor in not being paid along the way. Mm -hmm. So those are checks. I mean, we do many more beyond that, but that's just one situation that has come up where the tenant looked great on paper and then, or, or tenant looked great from just initial conversations, drove a nice car, whatever it may be that identifies as a quality tenant to a prospective investor. But we do checks along the way to make sure that that is actually who they say they are. They do actually make this financially. They're very healthy. And, you know, the that renter profile fits that property. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. it's not just income, right? You, you need to know what's coming in, but more importantly, what's going out. Yeah. yeah. And the, the creepy thing that we can do is actually verify recurring expenses that go out. And so if we see a rental application and the person says they have no pets, and we're always in favor of pets, I will say this off the bat. Mm -hmm. um, but then you see in someone's expense report that they're at pet value making a $42 purchase every single month. Yeah, they're eating, you're eating dog food. Dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so Neighbor's the, dog. the transparency is key because we always say to landlords, you know, we like pet owners. We think pet, good pet owners make really good tenants. And there's a stigma against, you know, pet owners because people have seen and heard horror stories of bad pet owners. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is as long as we have transparency into someone's information, we can lower that risk that Rob was talking about. And that's where pulling your own information is the number one thing to get across to people. You should not be trusting anything that mm -hmm. gets sent through by a tenant, no matter how trustworthy they seem. Because if someone truly is a quality tenant, they're going to understand your rationale of saying, listen, I understand you just got your credit report pulled two weeks ago, I need to pull my own today, and then you can get this property. Yep. And even if your credit is 850, you know, we still want to pull our own information. Mm -hmm. um, and that's absolutely critical. And we've seen fraudulent documents. And so it's just, it's a no brainer. You need to pull your own documents yeah. or have an yeah. expert do it for you. I, yeah, I, I be, be yeah. curious and cautious because if you're renting to two partners, for example, one partner could be the healthiest financially overall, which you, you said, I agree, it's not just always about finances, but everything could be in one account where they show you and everything looks great. And then the other account you go through and- Yeah, it's like a shit show. Yeah, yeah, so, <laughs> and just speaking of pets, just a, a, another point is that, you know, during the pandemic, a lot more people have pets now, right? And that's the reality of the situation. It's rare that we actually come across, I mean, maybe student rentals, probably mm -hmm. less so with the pet side, but most single family homes that we rent out, upper lowers, whatever it may be, have pets. Yeah. Right. It's it's very rare nowadays to to not at least see a few tenants that could be quality tenants with pets. You know what I do? Like when I used to do a lot of the um, advertising for my properties on my own, I always right from day almost from day one put pet friendly. Yeah. yeah. And I did that because I just wanted you to be truthful. Yeah. As opposed to lying. Like, hey, look, and, I, and I'm cool with pets. I don't I actually yeah. don't have an issue with yeah. them, you know, um, but I just want to know what kind of pet do you yeah. have? Yeah. Right. It's also smart advertising. So a lot of people still think that posting on platforms is the old school way where you post a property and then it goes down the page order or like Kijiji style where after a day it's on the second page and after the third day it's on the fifth page. Mm -hmm. Facebook advertising, which is where the majority of tenants are looking, acts completely differently. Facebook serves your ad to more people, the more people engage with it. So if Facebook thinks your property is going to engage with a lot of people, based on the traction, it's going to serve it more. That's a good point. Yeah. So if you automatically say no pets, right. you're losing about 50 to 60% of the population. Right. If you say pet friendly, within the first 48 hours, if you get more and more messages from people inquiring who are open to pets because they have pets, you're going to actually get higher up, quote unquote, in the um, in the order of Facebook serving your ad to people. So it's just smart advertising to put pet friendly, even if you're going to screen out people who have pets afterwards, it's better off to say you're pet friendly. You There's know? some strategy with even pricing, for example. Like if you're pricing from a certain range, right, and you're not getting tenants at, I don't know, just make this up like 2,400, whatever it may be. Okay, well, there's a certain filter that's happening on Facebook when someone's searching. Lower your price by $50 if that means that you, you know, don't have to have that extra vacancy and you're going to make it up in the back end anyways. Mm -hmm. So there's certain ways that Facebook works dynamically versus, as Hart said, like other others you know, listing sites that maybe are old school and and how they treat uh, you know prioritization of of rentals or, or what is considered like new rentals. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You know what I used to do back in the days as well too, um, and this was more when vacancy rates were a little bit higher. I used to put all credit scores welcome. Mm -hmm. I used to do that all the time. Yeah. And I, I don't know if that's a good recommendation in today's 
market. I'll let you you let me know. But the reason why I was doing it was there are some tenants out there that don't have the best credit mm-hmm. because of a divorce, because of whatever the situation may be. But it's about taking a look at the whole entire picture. Mm-hmm. Right now, am I wrong in today's market? Because that's what we used to do. No, and I, and I think you have to look at what market you're in and what your asset is. But one thing that drives me nuts—I feel like I'm just ranting <laughs> over that's, and over. Oh, I'm but good. real talk. Go ahead. <laughs> so, a lot of investors, especially who have properties in the GTA, they'll they'll identify with everyone else in the sense that rents are going up because immigration numbers are going up. Right, more people are coming to the GTA, but no one looks at how am I actually going to rent my property to that new immigrant? Mm -hmm. So regardless of of the people who have low credit scores, there are hundreds of thousands of people coming to the province and the city with no credit and no jobs. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, you know, I just interviewed an anesthesiologist who's coming, who came to the country. They were here for nine days and they were looking for an apartment. They're an anesthesiologist. All their documentation is from abroad. We can't verify any of it but they are likely to be an incredible tenant yes, <laughs> and an incredible couple year tenant who's just trying to get their feet under them. And then they're going to go buy a home because they're going to have a high paying job. Convincing landlords to position their portfolio for those types of people is completely different than the typical landlord who says, I need at least a 650. I need, you know, a, a 30% rent to income ratio. It's a different beast of a tenant placement offering. Yes, And so how are we going to house those 500,000 new immigrants coming to the country? We need to change our criteria for what we're looking for oh. in tenants. Okay, so it still works then. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm <laughs> telling you, some of my best tenants have mm-hmm. had not great credit scores, yep. mm-hmm. but yep. it's sitting down, having that conversation with them. Also, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a certain level of skill that you have to have as well too, to be able to dissect it yep. and know exactly what's going on with that credit report you know, why is, are you in this particular situation, mm-hmm. right? Because looks, man, there are, again, fraudsters out there that are really good yep. Yep. and can manipulate you. So you got to be able to understand the difference between that fraudster and somebody who just went through a legitimate hit on their credit. Yep. Just because you, sometimes you take a hit, you, you missed a couple payments, doesn't mean you're bad. No, Credits. and I think the, the, the opportunity that exists for investors like yourself who are open to that is massive you know you talked about hot markets beforehand i think the more important or the more important thing to look at is the opportunity to fill the missing middle you know it's starting to gain a lot of traction in the investor spaces now but a lot of people over the last three years because money was cheap were renovating properties or buying pre-con and they're putting all the bells and whistles in right it's quartz countertops it's beautiful flooring it's dishwashers in suite laundry all of the rest and they think they have to charge top rent because that's what they've spent. If you can look at a market with middle-class renters who may not have top-tier credit scores, who have generally you know, maybe 30 40% rent-to-income ratios, because that factor is changing, which is part of our rent report, um, if you can build rental housing or create rental housing for the missing middle, there is massive opportunity in the next few years. Those yeah. people with good-paying jobs, blue-collar, hard-working Canadian families, they need places to live and they can't afford top tier you know apartments they can't afford those quartz countertops but they don't care they don't want in suite laundry in every rental they're fine to pay coin laundry and go down to the basement and do their laundry so that's a massive opportunity that you know i personally am going to be looking at and Same. we always advise people to look at now as you know not only solving housing issues but creating lucrative portfolios and yeah i agree those i think those are two great things to use right pet friendly all credit scores well. Yep. Yeah, the the credit score shouldn't define the quality of the tenant. I agree. There's some science, some art and science that has to go into that, mm-hmm. the evaluation overall. For sure, life happens, right? Stuff happens where your credit score is not optimal overall. However, again, we've placed really great tenants who have gone through divorces, for example. And as mm-hmm. Hart said, in terms of satisfying the middle renter is that if you're going through a divorce, you don't want to pay for a premium property at that point, right? You're mm-hmm. trying to land on your feet, whether you're paying for lawyer fees, other expenses related to potential divorce. You want that, call it middle property. You don't want a high-end property that you're trying to land through. The one thing I was going to mention earlier was in terms of credit score or what is like a less than optimal credit score, honesty is the best policy, right? When a tenant comes through and says, 
hey, just wanted to let you know up front, I don't have the greatest credit score or whatever it may be, or you ask the questions to understand that. Yep. So much better to start the relationship off that way. 100%. And, you know, we yes, we've caught people along the way that we do that or through our due diligence where we, you know, find some things out about the tenants that aren't optimal. That's not just credit score, there's other things as well. But if they're upfront about it and identify the situation that they're going through, it's so much easier to work through that relationship and get more information about that tenant. And they're more able to give that information to you. Like it, we've been pretty good last little bit in terms of identifying, you know, who these great tenants are by asking those questions during a walkthrough, for example. Yeah. You know, it's not like we're like, hey, here's the property and walk on through. We're asking questions, trying to get to know the tenant as we're a representative of the landlord and going through. And we're trying to find out more information about them as well, right? The more information we find out, yeah. again, in addition to the data that we're providing, we have more of an understanding of their holistic lifestyle and what type of tenant they're going to be along the way. Yeah. Now, I was looking in your website this morning and I saw rent to own on there. Strategy that uh, that I used a lot when I first started. Are you guys finding that more investors are looking at that? Is that something that you assist with or provide? Um, I would say no and no. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. So that's uh, coming off then? Or? No, no, no. So we we have a partner that is a rent to own company. Okay. Um, and so if you're looking at rent to own, we're very transparent to say go to the experts, right? So Got we're it. not the experts in rent to own. Okay. We're hearing it a little bit more, mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't say it's a hot strategy that has popped up. Mm -hmm. um, but we've got rent to own partners like we used to do with property managers where we would just parse that out. So if someone's interested, they can go to our website, they can find someone reputable to run a rent to own operation for them. Um, but yeah, we're, we're not involved in that right now. No. Okay. No. Okay. Got it. All right. So <laughs> it's just more that you've got a partner and, and I guess maybe even multiple partners depending on the location. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, and I guess also too, when you're, when you're coming across some of these tenants, some of them may potentially even be a good candidate for rent tone. Cause they might even bring that stuff up as well too, right? Say, so, Hey, look, go over, here's our partner over here. Yeah. There's a lot of future technology op opportunities where you can look at someone's tenant profile. You know, we're screening hundreds of people. You can evaluate a tenant profile and serve them up the opportunity for a rent to own. You know, you can serve them up opportunities for mortgages or for you know better insurance policies based on their risk risk profile. So that's always something we've been open to with the data that we're generating through the website. Yeah. Um, but it's just about the bandwidth and the team to be able to run in a million directions and do stuff. But yeah. every time we're here, every six months, we'll give you a, another update. On <laughs> I know you will. Some cool stuff we're doing. Speaking of cool stuff, what about chat GPT? Are you guys using that at all <laughs> to your to your advantage? <laughs> we, uh, I've personally played around with it. I think it's interesting. Um, and Google's just launching their, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. They just launched theirs, mm -hmm. which is hilarious. I don't know if you've, if you heard the news, but it actually said, <laughs> as it mentioned, that Google should actually not be a monopoly anymore. Um, so it probably didn't work out well for them overall. But uh, yeah. yeah, I think it's interesting. You know, a lot of people are just from like a general interest side of things from a marketing side, I, you know, Hart and I probably have dear to our hearts that you can't replace or replicate people and, and people who actually have that skill set and creativity to create an ad or create an experience, for example. But just in terms of the application potentially for that technology to work with systems in the future, for sure, we'd look at it. Like we're, we're very curious overall. Now we have we used it related to the business, no. <laughs> but I think we'll play around with it the next little bit when it yeah. gets smarter over time. We're, we're working on a, uh, a landlord educational course and. I've always wanted to just create one module within that course written by AI <laughs> and give people a reward if they can find which module it was that wrote that section of the course. Yeah. But uh, it's a powerful tool, but I think everything that we're trying to do at RenPanda is about looking at you know, micro opportunities within the Ontario space right now and hopefully Canada within the next year or so. Mm -hmm. um, and there's there's systems, like you were saying, right? So if, if something like ChatGPT is built into our systems and can add value to it, then that's great. But we're always open to new technology that can make life easier, make things more efficient for our landlord population. I think for the capabilities of something like ChatGPT, if, if, for example, we're looking at just how someone does searching through Google as a basic platform, right? If you're trying to problem solve through ChatGPT on how someone's searching for a tenant issue or something that comes up and serving them up the proper information, 
not saying we're maybe that's an idea in the future, but I think like that would make sense, right? If a landlord is inexperienced in the path to go down mm -hmm. and Google isn't answering exactly what they need, or maybe even using the language that they need, that could be an application that works. You know, for example, just if we're just spitballing, I think like from a paralegal side, right? If you needed paralegal information, obviously this would have to be vetted by a you know an expert, but you know, if you needed certain language to use to the tenants along the way based on whatever situation came up. That may make sense, right? It's served up to you relatively easy and has a system in place. Do I think it's at that point? No, right? I mean, it doesn't have the ability to provide that information. I would always lean on an expert, but maybe in the future, there's something that happens where there's a system that you go in as a landlord or investor, you type in the situation that you're having and you get expert advice right in there. Instead of Google base is more like, I get an article that I have mm -hmm. to read that's gonna take 20 minutes to get the answer. I can just get it in a, you know, through chat GPT, maybe in the future, we'll see. Yeah, yeah, but, I mean, it'll be interesting to see where it goes, but I mean, like, you know, for where it, here's the interesting thing, for what they're allowing us to have access to with this chat GPT, imagine what <laughs> they got in the, in the background. Yeah. Imagine yeah. what they're actually using and working on right now. Mm -hmm. Yep. Jesus. It, looking even at, um, at the evolution of Facebook marketplace over the last five years has been really interesting because mm -hmm. they very subtly added extra criteria both for um, users searching on Facebook Marketplace as well as uploading listings. Mm -hmm. And that's goods, that's you know real estate. Um, they're slowly adding in more and more criteria to build a profile of um, housing on the market, of people within the marketplace. And the automation that currently exists there is, is already leaps and bounds ahead of where it was five years ago. And I mean, I foresee a, a marketplace on Facebook where the majority of things are automated when it comes to searching for rental housing or responding to rental housing or, you know, the the leveraging of that information that Facebook has into mortgages and insurance and risk yeah. profiling of people is absolutely massive. And there's billions and billions of dollars behind it. Um, when we first started at Panda, the first partner that ever reached out to us was a massive insurance player because they saw the opportunity with rental housing data. Um, and even with our new rental report, we've got a project in the works, I'll say, <laughs> with the federal government. Um, and so wow. there's the acknowledgement that CMHC data is not sufficient to um, inform public policy anymore. And so they're looking at the private sector for that type of information and the information that Facebook has, that Google has, that even small players like us at RenPanda have, um, have massive future implications into the housing sector and far yeah. beyond. You know what, it, just listening to that, yeah, uh, you, you know, the growth that you guys have had, I think in the last year and a bit has been incredible. And I remember when I first talked to you, I was like, Dar, these guys are moving. They're, they're, they're doing things, man. They're doing things, right? I, I could tell you guys were ambitious and and you had big lofty goals. And and it's incredible to to be a part of what you guys are doing and watching that grow. Mm -hmm. So congratulations on, on, on the success. And Thank listen, you. man, I know it's not an easy road. It's 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 you know, success. People think success is like this up like this. Nah, man, it's a hot mess. It's ups <laughs> and downs and great ideas and ideas that just don't work. And you know, I think you guys are working through it, but you're doing a good job with it. Thank you. Yeah, you know, it's so been a, a lot of, you know, crying in the corner, hugging ourselves, yeah. trying to figure it out. But uh, I think that's the reality of it. And it, it is. You know, it, it's it's a journey that you have to enjoy as you go through those ups and downs. And if you're just focused on the top and the end goal, you're going to fail along the way. And I think that's why a lot of people fail. And uh, I was actually just talking to uh, Quentin D'Souza a little while back and him and a few guys were climbing Kilimanjaro and I was talking to them about Kilimanjaro climbing Kilimanjaro because I've been there a couple of times yeah. and so many new mountaineers think about the top. They think about the summit as, you know, the opportunity and they forget about the journey throughout. And I think a lot of people in real estate, in business, just think about that ultimate end goal. And it's important. It's powerful. It's a tool that can get you motivated, but it's not necessarily going to create success along the way. 100%. You know, I was listening to this podcast, you know, Ray Dalio, mm -hmm. and he was talking about um, the the failure that he had in his first business. Mm. And then he got back into it again. And obviously, you know, he, he built and created this incredible fortune. And he said what he did different the second time was he surrounded himself <clears throat> with a really good team. Right. So he had this team and, you know, they're going through the in, in this jungle and they're figuring things out. 
And he goes, okay, now I'm like almost right at the edge of the jungle now. And I can see the destination. I'm, I'm ready to get out of the jungle now. And then he realizes, no, the fun part is actually in the yeah. jungle, which is the journey. Yep. That's essentially what you're saying is like, don't, don't get so caught up in the destination. The journey is so enjoyable. Mm -hmm. You know, you got, there's, yes, there's pains and there's, you know, failures and problems you're going to face. But when you, when you take a look back, when you get there, you're like, man, no, that, those were the good days. Yeah. Those, that was fun because I did it with the people that I enjoyed spending time with. Yeah. I think a lot of people focus on, you know, what's my goal in life. And sometimes your goal in life is to live life. Right. Yes. Enjoy living life. And maybe that's just the goal. Mm -hmm. And that's the intent of life is to live it, to enjoy it with other people, to realize that every day is a gift. And we've chosen this crazy entrepreneurial journey. No one's putting a gun to our back and saying, you have to start a company. You know, you could go work for someone else very easily. Um, but it's it's about enjoying that journey along the way. 100 percent. Yeah. yeah. This is this has been fun for me as well, too. You know, sitting down here, having conversation with entrepreneurs got the cameras on, got the mic <laughs> on and, and just doing this to share the stories with, with other entrepreneurs and, and hopefully people that are listening can, you know, get something out of it. And, yeah. you know, if maybe they're in this nine to five job and they're not liking it anymore, change it. Yep. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm a proponent of doing hard things. You know, I have a, a freezer in my garage filled with ice water and take cold baths and, you know, do, doing hard things is worth it. And I think having these conversations makes you realize that other people are doing hard things. Other people are as crazy as we are. Mm -hmm. um, and that shared community makes the hard things a little bit easier, but also makes us all do harder things. I and mean, collectively, we can push harder, we can move faster, we can do things that are worth doing. Um, and, and those hard things are really worth doing. When was the last time you thought about quitting? Which, which, in terms of uh, a product, or I think we always, there's always a little part like of your brain everything. that says, yeah. right, that says, ago. don't do it, yeah. or whatever that aspect would be. I mean, the, the climbing the mountain is perfect, right? Because mm -hmm. you go through it. I think you go through the ups and downs, right? Of, of like when we're building a product or we're, you know, building a process, there's always someone that says, like, hey, or, or something in your brain that says, like, hey, don't do it or stop or whatever it may be. But it's overcoming the challenge. That's the best part of of that journey. So yeah. I wouldn't like. I'm not going to sit here and say that like we don't think about it every so often. When it's like not not the business itself. We love the business, but if there's certain things that we build out that we're like, do we want to do this? Do we not? But it's that mindset that helps you push forward, right? Because you yeah. kind of work through that solution together and that problem together. Yeah, awesome. Maybe you feel different. Rob, yeah, Rob's so. optimistic. I was going to say every day. I, I was going to say, I just thought about it this week. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think that the ice bath is a good analogy in that, you know, I've, I've done this stupid thing and bought this chest freezer in my garage. No one, I paid money to do this stupid thing. And every time I open it up, my brain goes, why are you doing this? Don't do it. You could just not, right. You could just go back inside and be warm and cozy. And that's that moment of let's just quit. Like, there's no point in doing this. It doesn't help me. And then you get in and you freeze your ass off. And three minutes later, you feel like you're on top of the world. Yeah. And that's, that's what business is to me. Every single day I wake up going, I'm really, really excited for today, but also this is going to be the worst. Right. And why am I doing this? Should I just quit? It's but, the rewarding part. Yeah. But yeah. having good people around you, being able to suffer together and yeah. being able to see you know, the benefits of things, having calls with people and saying, they say, thank you, right? Yeah. Small and, little thank yous. And I think the thing with that as well, too, doing that hard and challenging thing in the morning, you've just conquered something yeah. huge. Yeah. yeah. And it allows you to go through the rest of the day and saying, okay, if I did that, I, I can, I can get through this. Like, I mean, yeah. you know, like I've talked about this a couple of times on my, on the podcast, I do yoga Yeah. and man, I don't have to get up at six o'clock in the morning to go draw, jump in my car go and do yoga, sit on a mat for like a, an hour, sweat in this hot yoga. And we were like, yeah, but you enjoy it. No, I don't. Right. I, I don't enjoy it. I enjoy afterwards. I enjoy the results. I enjoy how I feel. But the the, the beginning part of it mm -hmm. is horrible. Yeah. Isn't it, wasn't it Muhammad Ali who said like, I hated every day of training, right? I but then so. you like live like a king after, right? Yes. So mm -hmm. it's it sucks maybe in the moment. I think it's the same thing. It's the gym mentality. It's the running mentality where it's like just one step. Right. One step, get out the door, whatever it may be. And that challenge that you put your body through, you feel so much better. And it's so much more rewarding later when you go through that. And you can look back, as you said, in the jungle side 
it's like you're always in there but you every day you've gone through and yes i know yep. i'm more, a little more optimistic maybe about like <laughs> the situation but i do think it's it's small little wins right that get you through one, that. yeah yeah 100 yeah, just doing I, I think rob's point is perfect in that just doing something is mm -hmm. key and in business we probably said yes to our first customer ever before we had a product you know someone was like hey can you rent out my place and we went yep sure no problem 100 percent." we had no idea how to rent out their place we had we had no business <laughs> and we said yes and they were a happy customer because we worked our butts off yeah. and things got this is easier. when you first started rent panda your first client you mean right so we had, our first leasing client you know we we didn't do leasing and someone said hey can you lease out my property and we said got yes okay. we actually got our first website customer before we had a website as well so we were selling the idea of rent panda and we had people sign up without a website we said here's the thing that we kind of want to do will you sign up for it and it was free so it was easy for people to say yes yeah um, but getting our first paid customer for a product that didn't exist is that same thing we just said yes we said yep we're going to do this thing and then when people started to buy the thing, we figured out how the hell to build it. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Listen, um, Hart, Rob, thanks very much for coming in. Is there anything else that we didn't touch on that we should touch on? We'll no, just I think have we, to come back again. We'll have to come back again. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and, and yeah we'll do it. Know we're at. Uh, any last piece of advice that you guys can both share with, with anybody that's listening and maybe thinking about using your services or thinking about maybe getting into, into real estate investing or picking up the first investment property? I, I would always say... Don't email us. I'd rather you call us and have a one-on-one -on -one connection and conversation. It's so much better to start the relationship, to understand where an investor is, work through the problems together. We really value that relationship overall. Um, and we're always available to have a call. So yes, of course, go through our, you know, you might have to go through our, our site to, you know, connect with us first, but we want to chat with you one-on-one -on -one and work through the solution together, right? We're in this, um, you know, we're in the same challenge as you and we we can provide the solution for you we're the rental experts for a reason awesome and, a and the best way to find your number just on your website um yeah just go to rentpanda.ca yep. yeah. there's a form to fill out yeah. and we will call personally you. call you yeah. okay um oh so you're just gonna fill the form out okay, yeah got it fill out a form we give you a call within 10 minutes an hour wherever you put in that form yeah um and i'll just add to that that a lot of people undervalue their time a lot of people think mm -hmm. I'm just going to do it myself or I'm going to figure it out. And a lot of people are doing $20 an hour jobs mm -hmm. when they should be doing $200 an hour jobs, $2,000 an hour jobs. And so if people valued their time efficiently and effectively, um, everything would be better off because you're not going to figure out how to do your own plumbing work and spend all that time doing your $17 an hour job. You're going to go hire a plumber. Yeah. So not to tout our own services, but there are now experts out there and if you value your time at $1,000 an hour, it becomes a very easy decision to not spend hours and hours and hours on Facebook answering, is it still available messages? I agree with you 100%. In our mentorship course, we actually have a section in there where we teach you how to outsource and how to know Perfect. what to outsource. Yep. And you get, and so you can work in your genius. Yep. You shouldn't be doing these $20 or $30 an hour jobs if you're trying to grow. And uh, you know that's, that's great advice, great yep. tip. Um, guys, I enjoyed it. I will definitely have you guys back again. Sounds and um, thanks for sharing your story and your journey and, and, and helping these investors out there that need your services. Thank you for Thank having you. us. All right, guys.